Hey everybody, and welcome to Indie Recon 2014, our live podcast uh, session, apparently. Uh, this is called Write, Publish, Repeat, How to Turn Your Art into a Serious Business. I'm Johnny B. Truant, and uh, in the green shirt, Sean Platt, and in the black as his soul shirt, David <laughs> Wright, over there with uh, superheroes in the background. And in case you don't know us, we are the three hosts of the Self-Publishing Podcast, and uh, consider yourself lucky for not knowing us yet and forever ruined from here on out. We were trying to decide what sort of public image we should present here because if you then go back and listen to our show, we don't want you to be deceived at how uh, rude and off, off topic we are. Yeah, we're um, really terrible people. Especially Johnny. <laughs> Sean and I primarily, Dave, as a third author, were uh, the authors of Write, Publish, Repeat, which we shamelessly borrowed for the topic of this podcast. And that the tagline on that was the No Luck Required Guide to Self-Publishing Success. And with, that's which sort of, Dave didn't like as a tagline, which is why he's not allowed to talk about the business stuff today. <laughs> he's just going to grunt in the background. Was it the No Luck Required that Dave didn't like or the success part? Implying I, think, like I think he equally hated both. <laughs> I think he hated them in complete tandem. I'll yeah. let Sean speak for me. <laughs> that's as he usually does. So that's what we're going to try and talk about today is the, the stuff that we included in that book was um, it was it was how to take something that is generally considered to be an art and a soft form of a, it's almost treated like a hobby by a lot of people and turn it into a real legit business like income stream and I think that uh, I guess Sean and I, and we could probably beat Dave into submission, um, <laughs> would, would say that uh, uh, a, a lot of people, um, a lot, I would say the number one failing for indies that, that, that don't end up making money, a lot of them is uh, the failure to treat it like a real business. That would sort of be the thousand mile up image well, and then well, there's a lot of sub stuff under it. It's, it's hard and, and there's, a, there's a great moment I think in Right Publish Repeat where um, where we kind of talk about that that alchemy, and Johnny puts it really well, and he basically says, I mean, you got to think writers are artists um, by nature, right? Like we we want to create our art, we want to get it out into the world. And but then those, leave me alone. <laughs> those two things are sometimes at odds, and it's uh, you know your your art is 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 at one point it's pure creative, it's art, and then at one point it becomes a product. And that those are not th those are the level you know one and two, but it's not in order of importance. It's in chronological order. You first have to create something as this pure art, but then you have to figure out how to sell it. And and once it's on its way to being sold, it becomes something different, and you have to treat it differently. So, I, I don't know where to begin on this because it is such a large topic, but. The, the the title of and not to keep plugging like our book or whatever, but the why why stop now, right? No, Dave? talk about Unicorn Western. Just detour right now and start talking about that because that's what the people really want to hear. Wow. <laughs> the crux of the whole business approach to what is generally considered a hobby does center around the idea of writing, publishing, and repeating, which is why we titled the book and this session this way. Um, just FYI to everybody, Dave just added Google Effects, which is always a party. That's going to uh, be entertaining for it, us it's, all. It's just, yeah, it's going to be entertaining for about 30 seconds, and then we're all going to be like... <laughs> he he doesn't know, want to do. contribute to the business part, but he will contribute to the special effects and Twitter. So And or my <laughs> Every time you plug the book, I'm just going to hit the... That. Oh, that, that's <laughs> awesome. We're excited. Unicorn Western. So the... The, uh, the the idea though of write, writing and publishing and repeating is that you require multiple uh, multiple books in order to eventually make success. I'm a little distracted because there's some screaming going on out there. So if one of you could take over, that would be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> the people uh, I have in my basement, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, D Dave has the people in his basement. Johnny is going to go beat his children though. He he does that twice <laughs> in the podcast. <laughs> Father um, of the year, Johnny B. Truman. Semi-finalist. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, he really is going to beat his children. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Dave, would you talk about business? <laughs> oh, I hate you. <laughs> Dave's going to give his top three business tips right now. <laughs> no, you, don't, you guys don't want that. Okay, um, no, the, 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 the premise of Write, Publish, Repeat really is to, um, to, do, to, to treat it, I guess demystify the whole um, publishing thing a little bit because the idea that you can... Um, write your book and then get it to market and um, 
and then do it again is kind of you you want to think about it like work and i think we've the three of us collectively have had a had a pretty decent couple of years you know um i i i didn't want to be a writer when i grew up johnny did want to be a writer when he grew up dave wanted to be a writer when he grew up and and we kind of all we do it full time now this is what we do but it's not that we sit down and we write a book and then we get that book to market and then we wait for success like we're immediately back on what's next and we treat it like our business and we have schedules and deadlines and all the things that a normal real business would have and we try to tweak our variables and always move forward but I think it's the idea that it has to be treated like a business if you really want to see the results um, because just because we're trading words for money doesn't mean that that there's any the behaviors any different it's still a business you still have to grow it Stephen Pressfield talks about this a lot in The War of Art, which everybody should read. And it's, I don't remember exactly how it's put, but he says, essentially, it's something like this. Like, if you were, if you were working for a, a construction or something, would you just go in and say, well, I'm not feeling inspired to, to build, to put those, those, <laughs> those cinder blocks together today. It's just, I'm just, I'm not feeling it. And then would you kind of do it for a little bit, and then, and then you know, your, your significant other comes in and says... Well, I need you to go pick up the laundry, and so you say, "Well, sure, what the hell? I'm not doing anything else." And then you go and you take care of that, and it, it's. You, but people do treat writing that way, and we get a lot of questions on the podcast that that amount to something like, "Well, you know, I have one book, and I'm ready to market it and start making my millions of dollars," and that's just that's tantamount to to go to that construction <laughs> job and putting one one cinder block down and going, "Okay, well, I'm ready for you to live in this building." Like, it, it's <laughs> it's something you do every day. And when when Sean and I in particular, so the way that our businesses break down, if you don't know who we are, is that Sean and Dave write together under Collective Inkwell, is their imprint, and Sean's and mine is Realm and Sands. And when Sean and I, at the end of last year, in particular in that group, we were trying to produce uh, finished product funnels. So basically if we have one book, we're, we're trying to create a series and then some sort of a bundled upsell in most cases. And then that's a complete funnel with a free entry point and people can buy up to it just like anybody would do with any sort of a product that wasn't necessarily considered to be an art. And I, it was crazy, like crazy busy. And it was sort of like, well, I'm really loving what I'm doing, but I'm really putting in just absolutely nuts hours like a lot of people would do with a job and then say, well, I'm stressed out. And then when this year started, it was like, well, we'd gotten past that rush where we were creating all these product funnels and I told Sean, okay, well, ah, now I can breathe. You know, now I can relax. <laughs> Uh, and, then it was, built. and then it was like three days ago where I said I sent him uh, every once in a while, uh, about every three or four months. Dave, you haven't gotten in on these yet. I'm gonna have to start copying you. <laughs> oh, I have a panic email, right? Where I'm like, <laughs> okay, you got. I can't. St I gotta stop. I gotta stop. Like I'm, I'm dying. I'm dying. I'm, I'm gonna have a nervous breakdown here. I can't. I'm not getting any sleep. And but it's because we've now started a lot of the marketing stuff that we neglected in order to get product out last year. So we're doing a lot of. Um, yeah, Sean rebuilt all of the, the websites for everything that we're associated with. Uh, is building Facebook pages. We've started blogging on a more intensive schedule. And uh, Sean, th what the breaking point was, Sean said, we've got, got another thing we're going to do. And I said, okay, well, so i got to do that like once a month, right? And he said, no, you got to do it weekly. And so that's one more thing. <laughs> and so we this is a fun job, but it is a job. And I think that a lot of people don't treat it that way. And if they aren't, full-time writers, it's even, the tendency is even stronger to not treat it that way because it's like, well, I have a job and this is my sideline that's going to eventually take over and make me a bunch of money, but if you don't treat it like a business, it can never grow into that. Yeah, and, and really, from, from Realm and Sands' first project, before there was a Realm and Sands, when, um, you know, when we were writing our first thing. It, it, what was our first thing called? Unicorn Western. <laughs> you bastards! I'm trying was, to read see, comments. I was, no, I was trying ah, to just like on the navigate podcast. around that. So, um, uh, <laughs> Sean and so, I'll talk. Dave's gonna sit back there and hate us. Oh, wait, I'm, wait, I'm wait, seeing wait. if anyone has any questions. Oh, it would actually be useful. I wait, wait. I, I see all these tweets. Uh, saying, uh, I'm learning a lot. I just learned amazing things from the self-publishing podcast guys at Indie Recon. I mean, obviously, you know, they're, they're yeah, learning. Yeah, I saw that. I was going to call BS on that. 
Um, so I actually Vermont, want to deliver on that. that. <laughs> all right, all right. It's when we started writing our first, um, our first book, uh, way back last year, last last spring. But it's been a year actually. This is like kind of our our year anniversary right now. For you and Johnny. Year. Yeah, for last year's South by Southwest, we had written the first. Um, his the first lover, year. not his wife, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> John written, and I started in '08, and yeah, actually, yeah, 2011. Dave, Dave and I have been writing together for. We're going in. We're in year number six now. So that's I'm getting that seven-year itch. Yeah, well, Dave got the seven-year itch like, I don't know, an hour and a half into the relationship. No, you <laughs> did. You're the one that's cheating on me with Johnny. <laughs> well, that's true. Dave, Dave just stopped putting out a, a year and a, half, a month and a half into the relationship. Johnny's a slutty, slutty little boy. So, <laughs> Thanks, Allie, for saying we should just be ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> that was great permission. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so so right when we started writing that, um, uh, we treated it like a business. We had deadlines and we had word counts and all of that. And so we were able to kind of build the – Dave and I started – our first completed kind of funnel was uh, Yesterday's Gone. Should we do a little bit about what funnels are? Assume Don't ding for that, though, bitch. <laughs> yesterday's Gone. Don't ding for that, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so yesterday's gone was uh, my first stuff with Dave. That was our first collective inkwell. Actually, it was our second, but the first one that first really serial. Yeah, yeah, it was our first serial, and it kind of uh, told us where to go. Like we were serious about it at this point. So um, that was on October third of two thousand and eleven, um, and and we really hit two thousand twelve hard. Um, two thousand and twelve was all about like. Um, kind of fulfilling that promise. We did a weekly schedule. We signed a deal with 47 North, which is Amazon's uh, sci-fi um, horror imprint. imprint. Yeah, and we did uh, Z2134, a trilogy with them, actually. Uh, Z2135, which came out last year, and Z2136, which we're putting the finishing touches on right now. We also did Monstrous with them. Um, ever since uh, working uh, with... with um, with Johnny last year, it really was about the alchemy. Okay, we've got the content creation down. Like we're pretty good at that, and uh, and we we imported a lot of the systems that um, that had kind of been developed over the last couple of years, and into how to create really good, compelling stories in a, in a relatively short period of time. And we kind of unboxed that. We we did it our own way, and then we because we really treated it like a business, we were able to kind of refine things and 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 now they're they're really smooth. We got through the year and now we're back into the chaos because again now we're trying new things. But now it's not about creating the product. We've got that kind of on a schedule and, and we're pretty good at that. Now it's about what ways can we find new readers? How can we market ourselves? Because last year was about production and this year has to be about broadcast and amplification and getting better at what we're doing and bringing more readers to us. So um, again, the great thing about the three of us working together is that we can really refine our systems. So when Johnny gave me that panic email, it was it was awesome. Like I wasn't worried about it at all. It came in and I said, okay, well, great. Now we have our problem points identified. So let's take those variables out of the equation, put better variables in, and see what happens for the next month. And, and the I PS think is that that what we ended up with is actually more production. Like it's 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 more. Like it, it, he didn't then send me back and say, <laughs> let's um, do it, it. Just it it fit. We're, we're about refining and measuring, yeah. and those are things all things that businesses uh, do. I just wanted to point out really quick on Twitter that um, Free Booksy tweeted that Sean Platt's laugh is contagious, which is usually it's <laughs> like a donkey, a so brain like, donkey. As oh, I'll take contagious said. over donkey any day. I what if it were a contagious, contagious donkey? donkey? I think Tijuana has a lot of those. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but 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 treating your writing like a business does mean uh, checking, looking in terms of balancing. Contagious donkey. I'm gonna start writing that after the show. Income. Yeah, it's a bad idea to give us two words together that sound like a Gonzo title. Our list gave us caveman time cop, and we produced it. Um, but if you're treating your writing like a business, it means that you're looking at income versus expenses. So if a writing business would never say, "Well, I've got something that." isn't likely to produce a bunch of money, but I'm going to go ahead and spend $1,000 on this cover for it anyway. Um, my first book was, uh, it sells like f five copies a month now or something, <laughs> because it's just, it, it's, 
I love the book, but there's so much wrong with it marketing-wise. It's too long. Um, not, not that long is bad, but there's nothing tied to it. Like, I could have structured it differently. I could have had a sequel or a prequel. But it, it's it, the kind of book a lot of writers write. And that's the, and, and there's nothing wrong with writing what you want to write, but understand what you're writing. Don't just go out there and write something because you probably will be disappointed with the results. Just know ahead of time. Right. Uh, I forget where I was going with that. Some brain donkey the, the cover, me. the the cover. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah about right. the cover. Right. They don't don't spend a lot on a book that, you know, that's probably not a market for. Perhaps. Well, I ended yeah, up. And... I ended up doing. I'll finish my. I'll finish my point for the second. Let me just uh, finish that. <laughs> so the um, the, my point is that I, I looked at at expensive cover designers originally because that was my first published baby. And I had worked on it. It had been in some incubating stage for like 12 years. And I considered like spending way too much money on that. And and that would have been such a mistake to have spent that much because I still wouldn't have recouped it. But people do that because they get attached and they say, this is my art and it's precious and so I'm going to spend a bunch of money. Or I'm going to market the crap out of it in terms of uh, just broadcast advertising without having any real plan for it, it, how am I going to recoup that money. Um, you need to think in terms of you know time time spent, accountability to yourself, deadlines, um, all the stuff that Dave doesn't like, the deadlines. Yeah, stuff. and I think one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of authors make is that you do have to track expenses. And I think even when you get the writers who will agree with that and they'll track expenses and they'll be careful about how much they spend on editing and marketing and, and a cover and all of that, but they're not tracking their most expensive expense, which is their time. You need to know how much time something takes you. You know, if you're if you're a freelancer, you have to track the time you spend writing if you want to make money as a writer. But when we get into writing books, all of a sudden we don't care about the clock anymore. And there has to be some of that. You know, you have to be able to relax into your story and and let the story breathe and and take the time it needs to be told. And we're we're not for a second saying that that the the creativity should come come second or anything, but but again, it's sequential order. You put the business, you know, you put the art first, and then the business. And at the end of the day, you have to know how much something costs you. So when we're deciding on a project, we know approximately how expensive it is. Um, right now, Johnny and I are in the middle of um, Beam season two, um, and that's our most expensive project. Um, when we write the Beam, it's not Gonzo. It's serious sci-fi. Um, there's a lot of layers. There's a lot of characters. Um, there's, a, you know, it's the opposite of Unicorn Western is because there's a little bit of research. <laughs> you know, we have to know that the world is believable and that it works. And so just the time requirement for the Beam, it's more expensive for us. And we're okay with that, but, but we're not blind to it. And I think that's the important thing. A, a project can take you as, as long as it takes you when it's done. But when it's done, have an idea about how expensive that was because maybe that genre is too hard versus how much you expect to sell on it and something else would be more fun and easier for you. Uh, just just know. Just have the data so that you know and can make a better decision next time. One, one of the things I think that we, we try to do is balance the books that take less time and that we know will be more commercially viable versus the sort of uh, projects that might not sell as much, but we really love and we really want to write. You got to balance, you know, just like Hollywood, uh, you know, a lot of uh, actors and directors, they have their, quote, popcorn movies. They're good movies. They're, you, don't, you don't put out trash. Uh, we, we do not advocate that. Um, but you, you put out the movies you think will do well um, so, so you can afford to do the, the, the passion projects. That's yeah, my that's, take anyway. That's well said, and I, I couldn't agree more. Like you, you really do this want so to. So strange with that, Dave raging. I feel like he's bottled. <laughs> <laughs> he's not yelling about anything. Um, I was see. I was going to bait him. I'll, <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, I think it's 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 really important to kind of temper what you want to do because above all, like we we say that you have to treat it like a business, and while that's really absolutely true, that doesn't mean it shouldn't be fun. Um, and if, if the idea of business kind of wrinkles you or, or like that's the part of it that you hate, it, it might be good to have people in your immediate sphere of influence who can kind of help you with that and, and get you excited about that stuff because it's, it's important. You can't ignore it. 
And, you know, for, for, I mean, we're a trio here. We do everything together. We are an absolute team. What you see at the self-publishing podcast is two separate imprints where we're each creating our own content, but we really are a team. We do, you know, Realm and Sands has some fantastic looking covers, and most of those have been done by Dave. Now, Dave has no vested interest in Realm and Sands other than, you know, the better we do, the better he thinks CI is going to do because we all are a team. And so um, we... Everything we, is awesome when you're part of a team. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Everything, unless you're that one-star reviewer. And then if you... <laughs> if, if <laughs> Way to go meta. Jeez. Uh, yeah. Uh, Complain about it, Dave. Come on. <laughs> yeah, come on. See, we're just going to get you, man. You got to. No, just tell them about your morning, me. Sean. I refuse <laughs> to rise. Um, oh, man, okay. I got the sound effects queued up. I, I was just waiting for it. Um... <laughs> So, so we really, not only do we share art and things like that, but we share processes. You know, when we're coming up with something that, that, that works, Johnny and I will come up with something that works, Dave will reject it, and then eventually... <laughs> wrap all over. That is the process. <laughs> it is the process. Dave will reject it, and eventually he'll get beaten down into it and resentfully follow the list, which he calls rape eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and we're good. Wow. <laughs> and so... <laughs> um, just cut Sean's feed right now. <laughs> so it, it's... it's it, 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 Dave doesn't like the long list. He doesn't like all the business. I think also he appreciates what what we're doing. And he, he, he wants to be a part of that. And he wants it to be... Um, successful and so when we had to kind of break we had to we had to relearn some things because uh, we have all this product now we have all these books that we've written you know across of our labels um, there's a lot of stores there and there's a lot of series and we need to draw some attention to them so but we also don't want to stop um, creating new stuff so that really, really fine balance. We have to find how can we continue to produce? How can we keep it fun? Because you know, really, oh, that was the original yeah, point. That's I really, think for, really for, key. For, so the the oh, I'm sorry, are we going to go into the email because that's that was the thing I said. Is I said it isn't fun. Right. No, it is the fun. It's like because really the business stuff. As much as as much as Dave doesn't like it, Johnny and I genuinely do. The, the the business part is part of the art for us. It's it's the all of the stuff that you know a, a lot of pure artists um, don't like as much. It actually it's part of the art for us. It's not for less pure artists. It's just that that for us part of our painting is well, how do we get more readers and what little story can we give them that there's gonna they're gonna be more interested in what we do and <laughs> we just kind of broaden the definition of our art and so. The, the the core ingredient to that is fun, and if you look at you know all of our titles, like Unicorn Western was the first one, and clearly that was fun to write. You can tell by the title, right? That Unicorn Western was fun. It's it's it's. That, I that, actually that wasn't just, an attempt at commercial viability. No, no, oh, but I, but so, well, here it comes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so okay. Now Dave's just book, two. Let like your wrist sixteen ways is also a lot of fun. <laughs> No, just to, I'm actually in a hotel room right now in in, in Austin, and in, I, I'm I'm coming up from like a little mastermind group, and I was just downstairs two weeks ago, and um and someone who was up on stage identified me and said, you know, this guy wrote a lot of, of books last year, and I had Unicorn Western with me, and I I held it up, and the whole room just starts laughing, like they're that's that's it, no, in a good way, asshole. <laughs> they're oh. laughing. They, they thought it was fun. They were laughing with me, not at me. And and that's what we want from Unicorn Western. But more than that, that's what we want from our career. We want our career to be fun. Fun, just like business, is part of our art. And even stuff that starts out really zany, it gets serious. Like, we always dig deep in our stories. Our stories, Realm and Sand stories are a little bit philosophical. Um, they're very human. Uh, but, but they're always fun to write, even... Um, like a, a stupid title like Robot Proletariat ends up going to very serious places, but it always has its moments that are just really, really fun to write. And and to us, that's part of the art, part of the business. Um, for Dave, it's misery. If if he doesn't feel <laughs> a little bit miserable during a project, it's not it's not 
it's not good to him. <laughs> like, if something's too fun or too easy, Sean, it's I'm beginning awful to and... trust in humanity, so we're going to have to <laughs> turn up the darkness just a few notches. I just turn on the news. That'll destroy my faith in humanity right away. No, and it's it's totally, totally true. And writing writing two things in tandem, writing stuff for CI at the same time that I'm writing stuff for Roman Sands, is just so funny because it just... They really are, are different. Right now, we're, we're writing the very tail end of our zombie saga. And, you know, there's just, like, really mean things happening in the world. And um, it's, it's, it's funny. You know, one of, one, of the things, the kind. One, one of the things I've noticed, there seems to be a divide in the, in the indie writing crowd. There are people that, that, that want to pursue... You know, the great American novel, the book that takes them 20 years to write. And they see anything that's, like, uh, you know, commercially viable as, like, a negative, like you're chasing dollars or something. And whenever I see that critique, it, it, it kind of rankles me because, A, I'm not a business guy. I, I am the tortured artist, and I love, you know, I love writing. It's something I've always wanted to do. So when people say, you know, you're, you're, you know, writing what you're writing, you're just, you're just chasing money. Uh, you, you're just, you know, and we're writing a book about, you know, writing to make money. I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's about making money or quote getting rich. Uh, if you're writing, it's damned hard work. I work sixty to seventy hours a week. I'm sure these guys do too. What to me, what writing is, it's about making money so I can write more. See, I think there is a yeah. Kindle Gold Rush mentality. You know, you know, sit on your ass and just yeah. You're on write, the wrong podcast. Right, right, yeah. right. A few hours a day, and you'll be raking in money. That's not going to happen for you. That's not going to happen for anybody. Uh, anybody that makes money like that, that's short term, and you know they're burning through whatever goodwill and faith they have on their name when they write crap. That's uh, why they write in pen names, Dave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, to, to me, it, it, there, there is, you know, I, I wouldn't tell somebody to try to, you know, write the quote popcorn version of a, a book. And I wouldn't tell somebody to do that if that's not what they want to do. But I do think that you, you need to be able to support yourself if, if you're going to write as a full-time job. If you want to keep the other job while you're writing something, that's also a viable thing. Because if what you're writing takes a long time and you have no way to support yourself, you have to be realistic about it. And, you know, don't just quit your job and say, I'm going to be a writer and expect money to roll in because it's not going to happen like that. I did that. It did not roll in. It was very hard. <laughs> I lost a house. All right. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Bad stuff. Spoiler alert. But, but, but honestly, what, what Dave is saying is totally, totally right. And, and the thing is, you have to write what you're passionate about, what you want to write. If you want to write something that's popcorn and commercially viable, then that is going to be not only easier for you for you to write, people are going to enjoy it more because they are going to feel your enthusiasm, or in Dave's case, his darkness. Like they have to feel your your genuine. Uh, I tried to Dave feel Dave's darkness once. <laughs> very disturbing. <laughs> Dave doesn't write dark horror and things like that because he's trying to tap into that audience at all. Dave writes those things because that's what's inside him, and he's <laughs> he's putting <laughs> he's putting because it onto he's the really page. disturbed. <laughs> when yes. when when he puts children in jeopardy, it's because he's afraid of his child being in jeopardy. When, you know that, that's that's a common joke on our podcast that in the Inkwell books, children are always in jeopardy because they are because that's a very human fear. Now Dave is personalizing that when he puts it in the book. It's there because he's afraid for his own child and what he would feel as a father. But how many parents read that and feel that same visceral emotion? And you can only tap into the purity of, of your thought when you're being honest about what you think. And you can't do that if you're writing what somebody else wants you to write. So if you're writing a, commercial, a commercially viable book because you think that's what's commercially viable and not because that's what you genuinely want to um, – right or not what you would genuinely consume, you're making a mistake. What you need to do is write to your passions because then everything is singing in the right key. I think that there's a false dichotomy there too because that really rankles me too, the idea of um, 
I mean, I, 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 so for instance, I don't like classics, like as a reader. I, I'm not into them. I, I know that that makes me a heretic in a lot of literary circles, but that's okay because the literary folks aren't my customer base anyway. Um, I, I like, like, Fight Club is one of my favorite books. I just think it's awesome. And I think that there's a, there's a Trojan horse thing that occurs with stories where the same messages can be conveyed in a variety of different ways. And a bad book is a bad book. It, it's not that it's it's contemporary and uh, you know plot driven that makes it bad or good. It's not that it's old and Dickensian that makes it bad or good. But I think that a lot of the things, and, and this falls right into maybe not treating writing like a business, is when people treat it like a precious art. There's this. Um, we we had Dean Wesley Smith on our podcast, and he talked about the the myth of the the, the sort of the long suffering writer that if you want to validate as, as the excellence of your material you need to say how long it took and we so we we've actually, Sean and I've actually had this discussion so we need to wait to release this right because we produced it too fast and people are going to think it's shit because we produced it too fast but Dean was talking about that too and he he talked about, I don't remember the exact example he said something about Hemingway and about how what, what was the thing about Hemingway like he would just tell he would just screw with writers and tell them we have to. You know, oh yeah, he would just like. Oh yeah, that took me. I've been working on that since I was twelve. Like it's been a seed, and I had to massage it through a lifetime of toil, and and it was like you know he was just notorious about waiting to the last minute on his deadline, and he just popped it out right before it was due. But he could say that because he knew that part of selling books was the mystique of being a writer, and that you know the the more you poured into it. But, you know, the, the example I always use is, is a plumber, right? Like, if a plumber comes over to your house and he's like, I'm, I'm really working hard on that pipe downstairs and you're going to be really happy with how tight it is. I've spent three hours down in your basement working on that pipe. And you'd be like, fucker, what the hell? <laughs> like, hurry up and finish what you came here to do. And, and I'm not saying that, that writing and plumbing are, are the same, but... But they're both jobs. They're but people both get work. trapped. And you... People do trap themselves into that. That's a self-imposed thing. It's like, I'm going to be a... Because they go right hand in hand. They're like, well, I'm going to be a suffering artist. I'm going to talk about how tortured I was with this. And it, it took me the longest time. And then and then you wonder why you can't sell. Um, we, we talked a lot about the... I mean, this isn't news to anybody. But I remember writing... I've been listening to the audio book. So I, all this stuff is fresh in my in my head. Um, one of the myths of the indie marketplace, and this, like, well, duh, obviously, is that uh, it's a meritocracy, and that if you have an excellent book, that it will rise to the top, and that is just so not true. And would you rather have an an excellent book that never has a chance to see the light of the day because you're so precious about the art that you won't? you won't deign to think of it in any sort of a businessy way. I mean, what Sean said at the very beginning was exactly right. We believe chronologically art first, business second, which means that when you're in art producing mode, you don't stop and say, well, right now um, fighter jets are getting a lot of press, so I'm going to put fighter jets in my book. You don't do that crap. Um, but you can work within a set of limitations because you do like this is going to be an X number of page book and then when you're done you don't let art intrude on the business just like you didn't let the business intrude on the art I refuse I want to only write books that make no money in fact I'm going to give them away <laughs> it's not about the money yeah I I think um, I think that there's 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 a definite truth, and you may want to argue with it, but you really can't. I think if you have two writers, one of them is a good writer and a great marketer, and the other one is a great writer and a good marketer. The good writer, who's a great marketer, is going to sell more books because most people who are are consuming, most people who are reading, are not looking for great books. They're looking to be entertained. They're looking to be touched looking to feel something they're looking to think they're looking they're, there's there's something and it's not who writes the very best book that wins that it's who satisfies the need of the marketplace and that is a very simple thing and and for those writers who are treating it like something precious or or treating marketing as something that's inherently evil instead of something that can be quite evil those are very different arguments, and if you think about marketing as just how do I get the people who are going to love my books, how do I get as many of them as possible, 
into my world so that they can love first one book and then many, many, many more. That's like that every writer who wants to build a career just writing. And and again, like Dave said, some writers they, they just want to write the great American novel. And if that takes twenty years and they do it, you know, uh, twenty minutes a day when they get home, that's totally fine. That's a different thing. That's a different person than somebody who wants to write, publish, repeat, because what they want to do every day is tell stories. I want to tell stories every day. And I love the fact that I get to wake up every day and find new ways to tell stories and get people um, familiar with the stories that I tell. Like I think I have the best job in the world, and I think I have the two best partners in the world to do it. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. I, I think marketing done right is just finding more readers. It's all it really is. Oh, wow. Yeah, Somebody subscribed true. to Sean's hypnosis course. How's that working out for you, Dave? Look at that. How do you get <laughs> I him said to do done that, right. Sean? There's a lot of evil marketing out there. I go on and on. That's a whole other show. Dave's <laughs> I knew yes. I'd get him eventually. We even have a theme. Oh, fantastic. Good Lord. <laughs> All right. Uh, so what would you say? Uh, yeah. uh, go ahead. Were you in the middle of a, of a maniacal rant? No. Please cut me off. All right. So what I was going to say is the, the title of this, um, I don't actually don't have it in front of me. It's something about turning your business into a hobby. What would you say for the – I mean, we are atypical. We are three people who do this for a living every day. And, and as far as indie writers, that's a rather small percentage. And I would wager that a lot of people – the vast majority of people listening to this are probably folks who uh, are not writing for a living. So what would you say is are, are some of the bottom line first tips to begin sort of businessizing your writing? I mean, I'll go first. Is You need to remember that your books are products. And, yeah. 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 Um, I, I think the concept of the funnel can't really be beat down enough. And, you know, we've got good funnels, but even now... Want to beat it I, down some more in an explanatory way? Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, um, a funnel is just you it, think of a kitchen funnel or where you pull oil into the car, right? It's it's very, very narrow um, at one end and very wide on the other. And the, the, the widest point of your funnel is where people can first get exposed to you. Now, this could be anything. And the, the magical thing about the time that we live in is that your, your funnel is so wide. I mean, you're talking tweets, um, posts on Facebook. Wattpad, patio books, free downloads on Amazon, blog posts. Um, the funnel is how people find you. Yeah, it's it's it, you. There's there's so many possibilities there. Now, the better your first exchange with them, um, the better your funnel. So, for all of our products, um, it, it, this is really really important that m most of our series have an introductory point where it costs nothing for a potential reader to find us and like us. So that doesn't mean like, you know, a blog post or something on Facebook where they could like, but like a full reading experience. So here's, I, I have actually a, a physical example of this. Hold on. So just remember, uh, the key to this is thinking of your readers as customers, which they are because they're buying your book, and to think of your books as products. And just that mental switching allows you to say, uh, can I tell the Angry Birds story really quick? Because I think this is illustrative of a funnel. Yeah, you. yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I, um, I gave this example in Write, Publish, Repeat where um, I encountered the Angry Birds game because there was just a lot out there in sort of the, the zeitgeist. Of, I, don't know if, I don't know if Angry Birds is in the zeitgeist. Whatever, it was in the yeah, world. Yeah, it is. Okay, so the, um, the cultural lexicon. But I'd never experienced it. And so one day I'm just screwing around and I said, okay, well, I'll just, I'll just download the, the app. And the original Angry Birds... Uh, is free. And so I downloaded the Angry Birds app and I just I thought it was kind of amusing but more importantly my son thought it was very interesting and he's 9 he was uh, 7 at the time and he was thought it was so interesting that he went through and completed the whole game and three starred all the levels and so then we needed to buy Angry Birds Seasons which was 99 cents. And okay, so fine, it's 99 cents. But then we bought Angry Birds Space, Angry Birds Star Wars, and I think by then they start getting to be around three bucks. In addition, 
we bought um, Angry Birds. They have little plushes, and and they all make the same damn noise too, which is great. So like, <laughs> the, the I mean, they put no effort into it. Angry and Angry Birds, they're total whores. They're the crusty They spent the clown four billion dollars on it, so like I understand that. They're they're the, they're the crusty the clown of the modern age. Like they basically have Angry Birds shower rings. Like you could think, do they have Angry Birds X? And yes, of course they do. And so we bought everything. We had an Angry Birds cake and all this. But the the point of this story is, I would not. We wouldn't have spent any of that money if the first game had been had been even ninety nine cents, because I was curious, but not curious enough to spend any money at all. It just it had to be like no friction. Yeah, sure, what the hell? If I had to stop and think, that's well, the point right yeah. there. No friction. That that's exactly it. If you give. Um, any a reason not to do something, they're just so much more likely not to do it. Now, there there is a downside to free, and we, we could talk about that later. But as far as setting up a really good funnel, it, it, you just you have to have entry points to your product. So this is we you know, but we talked about if you can see this, it's it's a copy of Unicorn Western One, uh, just the little first book. Um, it's it's what is this? It's like a hundred pages. Um, it's a very small paperback, but it's available digitally too. Um, and it's it's the first one that we ever wrote. Now, eventually, we wrote another eight books this size and came out with this, which is our Unicorn Western Full Saga. And it's a monster. It's a quarter million words. It's really, really big. And, um, it's a joke at Dave's expense. Dave should never <laughs> say anything on the podcast or we're going to write a quarter million word epic on it. It's nine ninety nine. Okay, but the first one is free. And there's no, like, we talk about Unicorn Western a lot. I think a lot of people probably downloaded it just out of, like, sheer curiosity at this point. But it's free. There's no friction. If you want to go see what it's about, then it doesn't, it doesn't cost you anything other than the time to read it. That means the number of people who are going to um, enjoy it and bond with it and go on and read it are just, is so much higher. Now, by the time they're done with reading a quarter million words in this, you know, universe uh, it's a pretty happy reader you know if you really stuck with us through that book you know that we can tell a story you know that we made you feel because guaranteed if you read all of Unicorn Western you've laughed you've probably felt a little teary eyed you've totally been with them for that end of that journey and you're so like you're ready to try something else now we just got you to spend ten dollars and go to another book but you got to try us out for free. You were at Costco and you got the little piece of sausage. Like it was just no friction. You were walking by and you Our ate Our books it. equal sausage. <laughs> and it's not the same as a sample because a sample is a qualified experience. It's like try the first 20% of this book and then That's you, a you're, really the, the eye is all, the eye is always toward buying. The always eye is always like I understand when I download the sample I'm looking at a purchase decision and I have to make that decision. A, a first book free and we do first book or first uh, episode for serials free. And that is a complete experience. Then it's like just to have the book. It, it's different. It's different fundamental. So um, I, fat, my Fat Vampire series is the same way. It's just like book, boom. And you don't have to stop and think, I may download the others. You just enjoy the one. And it, it's fundamentally different. And, and so you may be wondering right now, well, how do I do that if I have a standalone novel? Right, that may be a very natural question here. Well, I'm not writing in series, and I'm not writing in serials, and I just have this one book. So, how do I possibly have a free entry point for that? Um, well, it could be a short story that it has nothing to do with your book. It's just in the same voice from the same author, and if you like X, you might like Y. Or it could be a short story that takes place in that same world with the same characters. Because if you write a book, think about it. That's a very linear. Um, narrative. Even if your book's all over the place, only these certain things happen to these characters. But there's always roads not taken. There's always things that happen in between the scenes. So explore one of those scenes and write a little write a little short story that that is interesting and can stand on its own. That leads people to this larger work. Now that's the key ingredient. It has to stand on its own. If you write a story that makes people feel ripped off or like they have to get the next thing to get an answer, um, that's not as good. Now, we've done that a little bit at the Inkwell simply because it's it's more of a serialized experience. So that is a little bit different. Part of what makes a serial work is a strong cliffhanger. So that that's slightly different. 
But for example, um, we have a book called Namaste, which is about a, a killer monk on a like a Who rampage said we of revenge. had Gonzo titles. <laughs> and so in, in Namaste, we have um, there's a free entry point to that. Now, we, we plan on doing a couple more books in the series, so it's important to have a free entry point. And we have a free entry point there called Vengeance. And it's, it's actually just the first, like, what, 20% of the book. So it is just a piece of that book, but if you just read that 20% and nothing else... It's it's done. You're done. It's, it's like, a full it, experience. It, it used to be called Prelude, and and I'm I'm mediocre on this, um, but I think it works really well for this. I would just say use this technique with caution because Extreme I think that there caution. would be a tendency. Yeah. Yeah. I think there would be a tendency for people to say, okay, it's just a glorified sample. I'm going to make sure my sample ends at the at the end of a chapter. Uh, it, it's not that. I mean, without going into too much detail, uh, the vengeance. The little the little prelude story is told kind of like memento. It's 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 a reverse chronological story, and it's called it's called vengeance. And then when you get into if if you read the full book through the vengeance part, it then starts the second part that was called journey. So it's really like the first. It is like the first book, but we it's almost like we bundle it in. Um, but it's yeah. a complete experience. Like you could read vengeance and stop and say, well, that was really cool. He got to the you know who we needed to get to, and there, you it has a beginning, a, a middle, yeah. and an end. It, it's 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 emotionally satisfying, but then if you like that, you're naturally going to want more because you you liked it, you enjoyed it, and and that's how we're wired. We're wired to want more of the things that give us pleasure. And so if you know if if Namaste ticks your boxes, then your or Vengeance ticks your boxes, you're gonna want to read all of Namaste. But we didn't leave a reader unsatisfied. We didn't bait and switch them. We didn't make them think they were going to get one thing and then give them something else. And those are all things you cannot do. If you do that, you will destroy your credibility. Yes, Dave. Uh, we have a comment from Samantha Warren. Uh, the Indie Recon drinking game. One, every time Sean Platt plugs Unicorn Western. Two, every time <laughs> uh, David Wright dings him. I need more wine. Uh, <laughs> Jamie Blair has a question. Uh, she directed Indie Recon, uh, and she's watching. She said, "We're fun. Thanks. Uh, why Thank can't you. I? Why can't I come up with story ideas as fast as the, as others seem to?" <laughs> oh, okay. it's my Johnny favorite this. question. I love this. But before we go into this question, um, I just want to mention one thing, and that's that uh, since Dave started reading comments, we are do well. Sean isn't because Sean's he's he's not going to be able to make the the Twitter chat because he's got some stuff. But Dave and I are going to do uh, a Twitter chat after this. At um, using the hashtag indie recon, so you feel free to ask questions then too. Um, so the answer to the question there is, and and I, I just I love this question, is that y you you have to learn to not take great ideas to make great books and say, well, where is this this magic vulgate of great ideas? Where you know what mountain do I climb and what guru do I pray to 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 find the great ideas? You have to learn to take any idea and make it great. That's the trick. And so just to give you an idea of some of the, and Dave's probably going to ding us, but I, I just, I want to illustrate these ideas. So um, Unicorn Western started when on our Better Off Undead podcast, which is the second, the one that we do that has no value whatsoever. Most <laughs> uh, um, defensive <laughs> show ever. It's, and it's, it's, yeah, it's really terrible. Nobody should, nobody should listen to it. Um, Dave, uh, Sean wanted to write a Western. And uh, he was only writing with Dave at the time. And Dave said, I, I don't want to do... End of, this is when Sean started cheating on me. Right. So Dave said, I, you know, I hold on a second. <laughs> I, I don't need to play that. I was going to say I have the short clip, but I don't want to do that. The, the point is... We'll reenact um, it here. <laughs> we'll reenact it. The, well, I could. I could play it, but I won't. And, and, uh, we should we do said, it as a stage play one day. <laughs> please... <laughs> We said you don't you don't need to do research to, to, to write a western. You just you know it's like it's cowboys and 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 horses and and so Dave said that Sean would get everything so wrong without research that he would including the color of the gun smoke like that was a big thing. You don't know the color of the gun smoke because it wasn't white, right? And he was and so indignant about it too. It's awesome. It was a real what's up, Dave's butt moment. That uh, Sean he said he's a he's a, he, the quote was you're gonna end up with a goddamn unicorn in it. And I so, said that. Yeah, Dave said that. So then uh, Sean said, oh, I, I like laughing. It'll be a straight-up Western, but instead of riding horses, he'll ride a unicorn. And so that was the spark. That little <coughs> tiny thing was the spark. And so then 
Sean wrote what we call story beats, which is the roughest sort of an outline um, for me to write. That basically was like we, we're going to take a classic. We we took the architecture of the classic uh, is Gary Cooper, I think, Western High Noon, and it, which is basically it's the structure of every Western. Bad guy comes to town, sheriff drives him away. Like that's it. Which is it, which is what Dave didn't get to begin with. That it's not about the research. It's just about the story elements. That's all people right. want. You know, you can't. You can't pretend like you're researching something um, and give them a shit job, but you write around it. You know, if you write a well, like this, you, you change the setting. If you try to bill it as an authentic western, you can't have your cowboy and an iPhone. It's just not gonna fly. People are well, gonna well, clearly, it. but I don't have to do research to know that a cowboy doesn't have an iPhone. Hey, Sean, hey, no, Sean. But, but, cowboy but, but, iPhone. Hey, next, next up. one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's going to be the Hold iPhone on. cowboy. Hold on. Shut up. Hardcore fans of the Western genre, they will see the things that you miss if you don't do your due diligence and research, and that will ruin the book for them. I'm talking if you're doing a straight Western. You guys didn't do that, though. But if you do a straight Western, you have to have you have to have it right. You have to get certain things right. This Johnny, is this is this is we need a straight western. <laughs> this is John's example of the, no. Of that's the, what it's called, straight of, western. Of the, of the comedian who uh, was a comedian, no, it's a singer who found his voice when he discovered he didn't try to sound like Johnny Cash or something. Yes, that's yes. what that is. It's like we wrote a Realm and Sands western. You would have written a collective Inkwell western, and there right. would have been children in jeopardy. Instead of riding <laughs> horses, they would have written children in jeopardy. And so, <laughs> so, so basically, <laughs> we took that stupid idea, and then once we were done with, I the hate you all. We said, "What happens to this guy next?" And and this, but the seed had already been planted. We knew, we named our gunslinger Clint. I mean, for Christ's sake! Like, it's how could you get more cliche than that? And the idea for for I have a series called Fat Vampire, which also came up. It came up the episode before Unicorn Western, <laughs> where Dave. Um, Man, that's were, back to back wonder. Back to back. That's a. That's I a am your words. fat muse. Oh, just imagine him in a diaper lighting above my computer. So again, he, yeah. So that was the seed. Was like, what if, if, if? Because we said, what if, you know, like Dave said, he wanted to be a vampire, and so Sean started joking about he wouldn't be able to catch his prey, he'd be running out of breath, <laughs> and so that little nugget became that idea. Now, the, my favorite example of this is Caveman Tide Cop, which is a, just a short story. It's not, it's not a book, and we did it as improv for our list. We said, hey, we want to write something for you guys. Give us a concept. And they gave us just dumb things. Like, I don't know. They just threw two words together. Like Caveman Time Cop. Like Caveman Time Cop. And so then we, we took them and we listed every single one somebody gave us. And we sent them back to him the next week. And we said, okay, which one do you want? And the one that won was Caveman Time Cop. Now, that's all we had was those two words. We knew nothing about it. We didn't know what kind of genre is that. Is it a caveman who becomes a time cop or is it a time cop who becomes a caveman <laughs> we, the canvas is yours and we wrote a story around that robot proletariat was originally built as Downton Abbey with robots and that's all we had you can take any idea and just build simple truths human truths into it i don't know if i'm like oversimplifying yeah, that no it's, no it's it's it is simple because we we sat down this was we we had finished um we had finished unicorn western and we had finished the beam and that was back-to-back -back projects that, that we did. One was really zany and a lot of fun, and the other one was like the polar opposite, like serious and like trying to create something more true and, and real. And Anyway, once we were done with that, we kind of thought, okay, well, let's see what we should do next. And we thought we would write a bunch of pilots, basically first episodes of a bunch of different things, and whichever one um, was most fun or... Um, our, our readers seem to enjoy most would kind of get voted to the top and we do a full season of that thing. Now we ended up doing full seasons of everything, all six pilots that we wrote, which was why we had such a harried year last year. But from those, um, it was really just a grab bag. All we had, it was just like when our, our, um, our readers submitted their two word titles and we picked one. All we had was this list of titles and we didn't know anything about them. None of the stories were there. They were just titles that seemed like fun to work around. And we picked the ones we wanted and then we thought, okay, what kind of story do we want to tell now? And it's it's certainly not the way that that Dave would like to write, but it's a it was really fun. It was it was it was a really fun exercise to kind of just come up with 
what what seem and and to us, but we made this point earlier in in the show, and it really is important. I think the more fun you have with something, the more your reader is now now that fun. It doesn't have to be a fun book. So even with like uh, we have a book called Cursed, which is a horror. I don't story. want to be anywhere near Dave's fun. <laughs> Get too depressed. And. D- 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 cursed is, is Sean. It, is it, you can't. You, you you like. You're about to say this great quote that people can put up on Twitter, and you interrupt yourself. You like. <laughs> I interrupt myself. Yes, you were about to say something. And you're like, oh, and then cursed her. Oh well, I don't know. I do that, but but we have this wow. this horror this horror title, and it's it's tense and it's tight and um. And it's dark. It's it's more of an Inkwell title than a Roman Sands title in some ways. But but ultimately, it was still fun for us to do. It's still fun for us to to, to map it out. So just because it doesn't necessarily translate to fund on the back end when a reader is reading it, no reader is reading Cursed and thinking, oh, man, I'm having a really good time right now. But they are getting our natural enthusiasm for the project. And if you're not enthusiastic about what you're writing, you're writing the wrong things. All right, so we just have a few minutes left, but I, I and I want to I want to close with uh, I can just imagine a lot of people because we get used to our self-publishing podcast audience and they know us and all this stuff, but I imagine a lot of people listening to this might not know us yet, and they're probably thinking, well, "What I have I done? What have I done? Why is this on? Why am I here? Why did I do this conference? Because these assholes. No, the um, you have if you have one or two books, or you 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 know you're you're a traditional writer. By traditional, I mean most people think you know you you write a book that's a hundred thousand words or more, and then you know you it takes you a year to do it, and then you write the next one. So, what are our first steps in sort of a, a condensed format to to just Make give that person some heart because right now they're thinking, well, what six pilots and I'm never going to be able to do this to businessize my my I hobby. Think, I don't I don't think quantity matters. I think consistency matters. I think the most important thing you could do for yourself as a writer is be consistent about it because there's no way most people are not going to write that kind of volume and most people don't need to write the volume. That's that's kind of the point, right? It's it's a matter of if if you've got 20 minutes a day to write write 20 minutes a day and be consistent about that because 500 words a day, 100 words a day adds up over time. So you shouldn't try to um, compete with that. Uh, it really just use it as nothing more than um, an inspiration point. Like I, I know that quality and quantity can be hit, so I could do that on, on my level. Worry about your level. Don't worry about what anybody else is doing. Worry about what you're doing and how consistently you can do whatever that is. Dave, you want to weigh in with your tips? Just, just write what you love. That's all I have to say. I, I write what I love. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky enough that people want to read it. How would you do that in a business-like way, though, Dave? How would you? I, I, <laughs> Try to keep us on brand. Well, as a, okay, a bit, okay, as a business type way, write what you love, but go and find the readers that love what you write. Uh, find out where, where you know their, their conversation. And what's that called, Dave? I was just gonna say stalking. Well, what? <laughs> would that be targeted marketing? Could that be something you could do on the internet, and then it could be targeted Shut internet marketing? Shut the hell up! <laughs> uh, uh, what, 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 one of the, like okay, uh, one of the things that I I think is a good idea, like if 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 you write something that's like lost, uh, or or the equivalent of you know that's being talked about now, uh, you know, blog about that, blog about the things that you like that your audience is also talking about. If if you have a blogging platform. That's one of my pieces of advice. Um, I don't know. I, I don't have a lot of business advice. I have, you know, writing, tortured writer, artist sort of advice. So you can ask me that. <laughs> can you get What's writing, the best way? Artist advice dot com? <laughs> What's the best way to hate life while writing? To hate life while writing? Write a lot. <laughs> and and, 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 and give Sean Platt your email address. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Send you lists and do um, book covers all the time, <laughs> every day, nonstop. <laughs> yeah, uh, basically learning to treat it uh, seriously. And I, I like what Sean said about consistency too. Um, if you have a pl- a platform, you know, a website or a blog, and you have a place for people to sign up for an email list, that can go a long way. If you just have one book, you can add a simple call to action, just a one-page thing at the back of your book that right after they finish says. 
you know, sign up for new releases or uh, ideally something better that I don't have a lot of time to go into now, just to start building that list. And then even if it takes you another year to release the next book, at least you've had a year worth of beginning to get those people into your camp. Yeah, you know what? I have, I have a nice piece of, of takeaway, like, like at the end is, don't assume that you are your reader. Now, you may be writing something that your reader will love, and the more you love it, the more your ideal reader is going to love it too. But don't assume that they are you or that their behavior is, is, is your behavior, or don't assume that they know what you want them to do. A, a, a last page call to action is, is essential. And you can't assume that, A, they know, oh, they like this book so much, they're going to go out and hunt for my other books. No, they're not. But they may click on a link with a page that goes to all of your books that are available. Um, so, so you really want to tell them what action you want them to take at the end of the book, whether that's joining your list or going to a list of other books. Um, and the other thing is, don't assume just because you don't like to be marketed to um, that your reader doesn't want to be marketed to, that they don't want to find you because we all like to be marketed to. We just want to be marketed to intelligently and for the things that we actually want. What we resent about marketing is being marketed things that we don't want or need and being like pressured or, or condescended to. But marketing is not inherently evil. Marketing just helps match products and services with the people who want them. And I do have... Let's just say, I, well, I do have advice. Forget my last thing. I was just going to say. Be, be, <laughs> he be, found himself, ladies and gentlemen. I, I just woke up before this thing started. Uh, my diet Pepsi's not kicked in. Okay. Before I met Sean, I had not written or, or completed a single book. I'd spent all my life writing, and I was unable to finish uh, because I, I wasn't taking it seriously. I... I I was getting hung up on being perfect. Uh, I wanted to write the perfect book, and that was it. And because of that, I wasn't writing any book. So after I met Sean, and we suddenly had to write, we, we had to treat it seriously as a business, I, I took the things I learned from being a newspaper reporter for three years of day day to day deadlines. Uh, that has helped me more than anything. Uh, knowing that I have to be in the seat and I have to be writing doesn't give me the luxury of not letting the writing come to me. I have to go out and find it. So that's my best advice. And yeah, for more information for on how not to market to Dave, he's got a blog post on. <laughs> <laughs> he does, actually. We're, we're... Um, don't wait for inspiration. Um, go out and grab it. Take it. Claim it. So we're going to be doing a, uh, a Twitter chat. Dave and I will uh, immediately to follow, just give us enough time to close up the Hangout um, on the, the hashtag Indie Recon. But I'll also mention um, that we're do, we, we do monthly Ask Us Anything Hangouts like this, but you can like submit questions. Uh, we're doing one tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern um, time. Eastern time. And it, it's on our... It's, uh, you'd have to join our list to get it. It's selfpublishingpodcast.com slash repeater if you want to check that out um, and if we talk about this every week in the self-publishing podcast and uh, I guess that's uh, and our book is write publish repeat so that's about it unless you have any other uh, additional things that was a little bit of marketing that I did there Dave do you see that I was just I, I, see <laughs> I wasn't going to do there. it but <laughs> he was going to see back there yeah well she, Allie's not here right now to tell us we can't do it so hey I'm going to be appearing live the next Tuesday night uh, so that, yeah, that that's it but all right. Uh, so thanks everybody for having us on. I'm Johnny B. True, and uh, again in the green shirt, Sean Platt, and over there in the dark as his soul, black soul Punisher shirt, shirt <laughs> David Wright. And uh, thanks for having us on the Indie Recon. Hope you found it useful.